Why couldn't Moses enter the promised land? I mean, after all that he'd done, right? Helping to free the Israelite people from slavery, leading them through the wilderness, putting up with their constant complaining. Why did God purposefully keep him out of the promised land? And why should we actually be thankful that God did this? Well, if you want to know the true story behind these events and begin to see why understanding this story is so important to your own relationship with the Lord, then join me for this episode of Beyond the Words. Now, before we start, if you're interested in learning more insights that will help you to understand the Bible more clearly and see it with an entirely new set of eyes, then make sure to click the link above and down in the description where you can download a free book I wrote called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. It's a quick but powerful read that will teach you a whole lot in just a short period of time. Just like this video. Speaking of, let's dive in. The reason for Moses being kept out of the promised land actually traces itself back to the very beginning of the Exodus story, to an event that happened soon after the Israelites cross the Red Sea and enter into the wilderness. In Exodus 17, scripture says, the whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Now this event occurs at the very beginning of the wilderness story, as soon as Israel is free from slavery. Leading up to this, God helped the Hebrew people to cross the Red Sea. God provided them with water, and then God provided them with food. Well now, the people are asking for water again. And by asking, I mean they're asking like a three-year-old at lunchtime, right? Because notice the word that the Bible uses here. It says quarreled, right? This isn't polite asking. This is, I want water. Nevertheless, God helps them. And Exodus continues, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Go out in front of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink." Now, I really want you to pay close attention to what just happened here. God tells Moses to go to a rock, take his staff, and strike the rock. Now, let me say that again because this is really important. God says, go to a rock, take your staff, and strike it. That will produce water. Now, what many people don't know is that this isn't the only time that this happens. Right? Years later, just as the Israelite people are about to enter into the Promised Land, as they go near the end of their journey through the wilderness, once again they find themselves without water. And look at how things unfold this time. In Numbers 27 it says, Now there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness, that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Now, did you notice the similarities to our first passage? Right? Once again, the same sort of thing happens. The people are in the desert, they have no water, and they lash out against Moses. And, and notice how it used the exact same word here, quarreled. And so once again, Moses seeks God's help. But this time, things unfold a little bit differently. And, and I really want you to pay close attention to the differences here. Because in Numbers chapter 27, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. Now, did you catch it? Because this is a critical moment. Once again, Moses approaches God for help. And once again, God instructs Moses to take his staff. But what does God tell him to do this time after grasping his staff? He tells him to speak to the rock. Right, in the Exodus passage, God said to strike the rock, but this time God says, speak to the rock. And this is really important because pay attention to what happens next. Numbers continues, So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to him, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? 
Now, let's just pause for another moment here, right? Because let me ask you, what does Moses sound like as he speaks to the Israelite people? Is he patient with them? Is he kind to them? No, he's mad at them. And so look at what he does. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out and the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. In other words, God tells Moses, because of what you just did, despite all that you've done, you will not enter the promised land. Now, if you're anything like me, you're probably thinking, that seems really unfair. I mean, Moses makes one mistake and now he's no longer allowed to enter the promised land? What about everything that he's done before this? I mean, is this who God is? You make one mistake and you lose everything? That's awful. But before we jump to too many conclusions, we've got to look closely at what we just read. Right? This is why I wanted you to pay such close attention to what happened in these stories. Because the answer to this problem is in those details. I mean, let's think back, right? In the first story, God tells Moses to take his what? He says, take your staff. And then he tells him to do what with it? He says to strike the rock. Well, this is how he's going to get water that time. He strikes the rock. But in the second story, things are different, right? God tells Moses to take his staff. And this time he tells him to do what to the rock? He says to speak to it. And while this might seem small, this makes a big difference. And here's why. Think about where Moses and the Israelites are the first time Moses draws water from the rock. They've just escaped Egypt and entered the wilderness, right? Immediately before that, they've been slaves for hundreds of years. When Moses hits that rock, they've barely even tasted freedom. But by the end of the story, things are different, right? They've been out of Egypt for almost 40 years. A new generation has been born, the generation that will take over the promised land. And that matters. You see, each time Moses approaches the rock, God commands him to take his staff. Now, the Hebrew word here for staff is the word mate. And it's the word that appears in scripture beyond just these passages, right? In fact, mate is the same word used to describe the staffs that Moses and Pharaoh's men throw down that turn into snakes, right? That moment when Moses' staff consumes all of their staffs. And Moses' staff is more powerful than Pharaoh's in that moment, right? This is a moment that says God is more powerful than Pharaoh. Well, the staff meant something very important to the Israelite people. Because all around Egypt, they saw images of Pharaoh. And in many of these images, Pharaoh was holding two things. A rod and a staff. See, the staff looks like a shepherd's crook because it was believed that Pharaoh guided the people just like a shepherd. But the Israelites knew very well what kind of a shepherd Pharaoh was, right? How he used that staff. He shepherded his people through violence and slavery. Pharaoh was a bad shepherd. But when Moses comes along, Pharaoh is no longer the shepherd of the Hebrew people. Moses is the new shepherd of the Israelite people, right? And this is hinted at throughout the Exodus and the wilderness stories. When Moses encounters God at the burning bush, we're told that he is shepherding a flock. Right? He's shepherding because he's a shepherd by trade. Then in Numbers, Moses says, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over this community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in so the Lord's people will not be like sheep without a shepherd. He's alluding to the fact that he has become the shepherd of Israel. Right? He sees himself this way. But he also knows that he can't continue to do this, right? They need a new shepherd. And here's how all of this ties together. When the Hebrew people came out of Egypt, they still thought like slaves, right? All they knew was a violent shepherd, a shepherd who works through force. And so this is the kind of shepherd that Moses was for them at that moment, right? This is why God commanded him to strike the rock. He acted as the only kind of shepherd they knew, one who shepherds with force, but 40 years later, things are different, right? A new generation has been born, a generation who knows nothing of slavery, who cannot be slaves, right? They're about to enter the promised land. And God does not want slaves to inherit this promised land. God wants free people to inherit this land that he's giving them. Which is why this time, God doesn't command Moses to strike the rock like Pharaoh. God commands Moses to speak to the rock like a true shepherd. 
to reflect not the man who enslaved them, but the God who has freed them. But what does Moses do? He strikes the rock again. Because despite everything that has happened, this part of Moses has not changed. Right? And this, this is why Moses cannot enter the promised land. God may have wanted to have Moses lead the people into the promised land, right? He'd been an amazing leader, but Moses revealed his heart in that moment. It's not just that he disobeyed God, right? It's how he disobeyed. He chose the way of Pharaoh, and Pharaoh can't go with the people into the promised land. They need a leader whose heart will teach them to be free. And so Moses stays behind, not simply as punishment, but for the good of God's people. They have a new future ahead of them, and it's in their best interest that Moses should not be a part of that. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Now, if you haven't done so already, please take a moment to click the link above and down in the description where you can download my free book called 10 Words That Will Change the Way You Read the Bible. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, videos that will change the way you see challenging passages in the Bible, then just click this link right over here. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time.